Um, all right, hello everyone and welcome to Digital Demos. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about essentially what is a charrette um, and sort of the challenges of designing in um, designing a project in around 10 days, um, sort of the hurdles or any questions anyone might have on really just how do I figure out an idea quickly and develop it efficiently. Uh, joining us today, we also have two Stewardson finalists, Hutton Moyer and Drake Schaefer. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what the Stewardson is, it is a 10-day project um, commonly participated in by fifth-year students um, in which they have, I believe it's 10 days to design a project and they're not allowed to have any input from any professors and on a rule of no classmates as well. Um, so I will kind of let it go off there. Um, I asked Hunt and Drake both to kind of just prepare something in general to talk about, nothing too formal, but just kind of, you guys can both pretty much just talk about your experiences and kind of what you've learned from your time with the Stewards and other projects. Cool. Drake, I'm not sure if you want to riff about some of the stuff that we'll talk about. We could do that. Cool, okay. So, um, I'm not sure if we want to screen share or if we want to talk about things. Um, I, uh, the only thing I prepared is like, I made a little timeline of what I did during over those 10 days, um, but not so much how I did it. Oh, that would be, that would be awesome to just see that. Cause I think one of the big things that we're struggling with is time. Cause also not just on charrettes, but like in design in general, when you have more time, it feels like we end up just spinning our wheels longer. I can show this quick. It's real, it's real fast. All right, everybody see that? All right, so this is the Stewartson timeline. Uh, although for me, your mileage may vary. So again, as uh, Sal kind of mentioned, it's like a 10 day competition uh, for the Stewartson. Um, it's pretty much usually in January, like mid, uh, I think ours is like the 17th to the 27th or something like that. That sounds about right. Um, so just kind of briefly uh, go over how I spent those 10 days personally. Um, all right. So the first day, um, I pretty much just spent it reading the prompt. Um, I read it, read it again. Like I probably read it over the thing like 10 separate times. Um, I was planning on going home that weekend anyway, so I knew I wasn't going to spend much time actually designing. Uh, the second day, I just spent it making playlists uh, in, Sp in Spotify that were vaguely related to the Stewartson. Um, so it's essentially just, for our case, all songs about fire, because uh, that was like a central theme for our project. Uh, the third day was really research heavy. Um, so, so just to, to give you some brief uh, background information on our project specifically, um, we were designing a fire watch tower slash climate research center over on Mount South Mount Hawkins uh, in Los Angeles County um, with the primary theme that this structure will catch on fire and when it does, not if, um, it should become a monument uh, as well. So like I researched like, you know, forest fires that led me into, uh, there's this fire department that's all kind of ran by these local uh, indigenous tribes called the Shumash people. Um, and then I really kind of delved into their culture and that's that was kind of the cornerstone of my project from there. Um, so the fourth day was all conceptual, coming up with the, the narrative spin for my project. Um, I basically took their creation story, um, the story of how the condor used to be this majestic white bird until it was enticed by the fire that man created. And it was forever kind of scorned as this, you know, the black creature we see condors is now. Fifth day after that, solely form development, taking, um, you know, almost a literal interpretation of a lot of these pictographs and just sketching them all together. This one page right here is all of the sketching I did for the entire Stewartson project. Um, and then just some basic form development in Rhino from there. Um, I knew because of the competition, I wanted to work out whatever my main views were really quickly. So I threw some test renders together, um, 
quickly try, narrowed down where I wanted to take these shots from, also kind of developing the model throughout. Um, so you can see the kind of process towards, you know, a couple test views towards the initial money shot view I ended on. Same for the memorial that would come after the structure is destroyed, doing a couple test views, finding the one that fit. And then the last three days were simply just production, 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 um, working on the drawings, working on the renderings, getting all of the components for the project that I needed. And then the last day was just simply setting up uh, how everything was going to lay out. In our case, it was two 20 by 40-ish boards uh, oriented vertically. So I decided to kind of blend them together into one seamless board. And this was the final result. All right, thank you, Drake. Um, Hutton, did you have anything you wanted to go over first before we kind of just start riffing, as you said earlier? I'll start by saying that Drake um, <laughs> followed an awesome plan. I personally didn't. Uh, yours was a lot more in depth and kind of structured, where I personally, uh, the first day, I didn't read the prompt. Second day, I didn't read the prompt. <laughs> and then it was probably about the third day, that's when I actually sat down and read it, and then did a quick party concept sketch of just kind of one of the first ideas that I had and essentially ran with it. Um, I actually started laying out the board, my board, the first, like probably the third or fourth day. Um, and in order to lay out the board, that's kind of what gave me an idea on what type of pictures, renderings, information I wanted to put on the board in order to kind of tell the story, tell the project. Um, so it was a little backwards but it still works. Everyone works differently. Uh, yeah. I, I do want to add quickly, I didn't like think of the structure I used beforehand. This was, this is me just like mapping a past yeah. event. Yeah. It's interesting because now like, now that, that you mapped the structure, it just really goes to show how each person kind of works mm -hmm. completely differently. Like Kyle behind me who just popped in. Um, I'm not sure how long you're saying, but we may be able to talk about one of the shreds that we worked on together for was it like a week. I think it was a week, something around there. And after working together, we realized that we had two totally different workflows, but we were able to make it work, make it mesh, um, and ultimately come out with a pretty cool project. But looking back at it now, it's kind of like, eh, why'd we do that? <laughs> so, I mean, it's just like all things, uh, the first time you do it, it's probably gonna be messy, it's gonna be weird, it's gonna feel uncomfortable, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, and it's yeah. never gonna be perfect. Right, yeah, that's another thing that will really bog you down. And that's something that always bogs me down when I'm working is I try to be a perfectionist. The only thing is I'm really bad at being a perfectionist. So nothing's ever perfect. And I ultimately end up wasting time trying to make something perfect that will never be perfect. So. Uh, Perfect. The perfect is the enemy of the good. That's uh... all right. That's all I have. See you guys. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Kyle. <laughs> um, so you guys both had kind of super different workflows uh, with Hun starting a little bit later in the project and Drake kind of getting started right away. Uh, what do you guys think were some of your kind of pitfalls or maybe even advantages that you kind of achieved from those workflows? Um, so usually when it comes to like studio projects, I had a tendency to really hit the ground running. Um, and I know because of the way I kind of charted it out, it seems like I really started from the first day. Um, but I never really, I, and I guess, you know, I read the prompt and I kind of let my mind wander about the project, but I didn't start putting, you know, pen to paper. I didn't start thinking about this in like any architectural sense until like the fourth day of actually like working on this project. Um, and I think starting later it helped me because I had I had a really solid foundation of like the concept and the party that I wanted to work off of. Um, and I wasn't scrambling to kind of find a form, make it fit a party, find a party, make it fit a form. 
um, which is something I normally feel like I struggle with quite a bit. I was muted. How do you guys come to like the decision about what you're going to move forward on? Like, how do you know you're not going to make a better, get a better idea? Like Hutton, you said like the two of you came together and had completely different stuff. And now looking back, it's like, oh, we probably could have done better. But I mean, like, when is it that you realize that you have to move forward? That's a really good question. Um, Cause there's times where we talk to each other, where like we have to make a decision because we don't have time. I think it's a lot of it comes down to the realization that you don't have time and just sucking it up and moving forward. And like, I know there's times where there is multiple options in front of us. And even if I didn't realize some of those options, I would try to lay something out like option A, B, and C. And then you list the pros and cons. And this could be just like really quick, write them down to each idea and you essentially just try again, list out the pros and cons and then see, okay, what, which one do you like the most? Because at the end of the day, it's your design project. It's, you know, your creation. What do you like the most? What are you going to have the most fun working with? Yeah. And then just pick that one. And even if it's not the right one, even if it's not the perfect one, I mean, still just try to attack it, try to do the best you can on it and try not to, it's a big mental state and mental game. You can't, constantly think about like oh i could have done this or i should be doing this it's just like yeah. take it and run with it just go right right i mean i think it's i think that's the thing is like a lot of people think that they're going to come up with the next best idea and it's really important to have the best idea when sometimes it's just about having a good idea and communicating mm -hmm. it really well right and that takes time so if you're like spinning your wheels coming up with ideas we can all come up with ideas but can you communicate it well the, I um, kind of a saying that I always hear tossed around is just like, what's the point in trying to recreate the wheel? Like it's already been done multiple times. It's just, you haven't done it, but also is there a way to kind of show the wheel a better way, mm -hmm. right? I know there's different ways of how people say that, but um, that's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, every time you do something, it's the first time that you're doing it. Totally. Yeah, we were having this, we were having this um, same conversation actually in the, the crit that we were having right before, right before we started this today. And like, as soon as everyone gave a, either a name to it or like Ivano's right on, like there's this preoccupation, like what is the jury going to think? What is the reviewers going to think? What is my, what does my design critic want me to make? And like, you get so caught up in trying to do that. You're not actually exploring the experience that you set out to design. Like every single review that we had this afternoon, at the end of the review, we said, so your initial idea was good. Just keep doing that. Like stop spending time trying to figure out what like your professor wants you to make. Just figure out how to communicate it better. Cause there's no time to do that. And that's actually what our profession is all about. So. Um, my clients always, always want me to reinvent their house for them. They just want a really, really nice house. I always appreciate the people that could take um, criticism or critiques from alumni or older, older students and just say, okay, cool. And just continue what they're doing. You know, it's kind of that at the end of the day, it's like, ah, he's not listening. He or she's not listening. But then, you know, at the same time, it's just like, they know what they want to do and they're just going to do it. So there's something to be said about that, something to pay attention about that. And with the whole idea of getting rid of the idea of what the jurors are going to want, that's extremely important. I personally found it to be so much easier when I had no idea who I was designing for or who was yeah. actually, well, not who I was designing for, but who was going to be looking at the boards or presentation. You have to um, rely on yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. At the, at the end of the day, you're the one spending, you know, hundreds of hours looking at this project. Um, don't let the person who's going to look at it for 15 minutes dictate what it should be. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you got to design some like your, your, your job, like the reason why we spend our time getting to understand and getting to know and empathize with clients is so that because the clients can't be designers. So we need to empathize with them. And then we need to be the conduit for that. But also that means that there's you in it too. You can't not put you in it. Um, 
I'm wondering, I'm wondering what other kind of questions there are. So right now in our studio, everybody has, you know, ideally they have two weeks, but really like we spin our wheels trying to come up with some ideas. And then it's like, oh, I got three days. I need to make it this. And so every once in a while, it's, um, I don't know, we call it, oh crap, I have to make a building syndrome and we don't use the word crap. Um, how do you guys, like, when do you, when do you, when do you just get a block because it's faster and you put it in or you're, you, you realize you're blocking yourself and you need to go like, I don't know, listen to songs about fire trick. <laughs> um, like, how do you, how do you know when you're getting in your own way and you just need to loosen up? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I know for me, it's pretty evident. Like the moment I start looking at a sketch and just start biting on my pencil and like picking at my ear. I mean, like those are quite evident where I realize I'm starting to stress over something stupid. And I tend to do that a lot. I know a lot of people who tend to do that a lot. But the moment you catch yourself doing that, take a walk. Literally just take a walk, take it, detach yourself from it. That's what I do. Come back to it and realize that you're overthinking something. And just even if you have the opportunity to or uh, the capability to move forward, and come back to it you know it's kind of like those scantron tests or whatever type of test where it's just like you don't know the answer keep going come back to it start come back to it later i mean that's that's important it was uh, another one of the students said like we we had students coming in like every 15 minutes a student would come in so a fresh face would come in so we asked them without knowing what they were looking at we asked them for their impression of what they were seeing on the screen because that was really valuable because you were getting feedback without biasing their answer. Like they had no idea what you were talking about. You're asking them. So you're asking them for their impression. So they feel free to just give whatever response. There's not, they're not being judged about it. There's not a, and it was amazing. Like sometimes, sometimes students who blindly just came in and started talking about what they saw had a more honest, real, take on what the idea was than the students who were like listening so hard because they wanted to like either please their friend or they didn't want to say the wrong thing or offend each other but like that feedback was so helpful because it was legit like you knew they meant it and they meant it not for good or bad they just meant it because that's what they were seeing it's just like what do you see in this i think sometimes we have to do that with our own work like you got to get out of your own way and just say is this drawing like can I put more lines on this? Not like, should I? Do I need to? Does the professor make me want to? Does, do I want to to please the professor? Like, how many more lines do I need to put on this to convey the idea? Ivano's trying to, Ivano's trying to put questions to the younger years. <laughs> so that so um, the old heads stop talking. Yeah, well, I was just about to say um, to make sure that uh, Andrew doesn't take over the entire He'll mute himself. demo. <laughs> um, I was going to ask if anyone else has any questions um, in case someone hasn't looked at the chat. Um, this is just an informal open discussion. So you guys can either just cut in and speak with your mics or you can feel free to just type something in the chat and I'll read it off. Um, so I would like to say a lot of this stuff gets easier. Like how Andrew yeah. was saying, like, do I add extra line weights to something? It's just like, you know how long something will take because you've done it so many times. So at, at the end of the day, like by the time fourth year, fifth year rolls around, you'll be able to say like, no, I shouldn't really work on that because I know I'm just going to waste time. I'm going to go down a rabbit hole if I try to make something perfect or try to do this. Skip it. Go on to the next thing. I once spent, I think, two days working on a single render. No one looked at that render. <laughs> so it's like, pick your battles and be smart about it. Funnily enough, I spent two days working on a render because I knew that was the, that was the big ticket thing for my board. Everything, I was like, you can spend four hours on every other part, but you're spending the two days on this one. Mm -hmm. I saw Jessica, um, she asked a question about board layout. Um, I'm gonna take this time to do a screen share because personally for me, I think some of the quickest uh, projects that I've done were some of my most favorite boards. 
Before I start anything, I typically always do a board layout first, just to try to get an idea of, you know, the scale of a drawing, how big do I want to make a drawing, where does the hierarchy want to go, uh, and a lot of that comes from either looking at inspiration online. A lot of it actually comes from looking at inspiration online where it's just like, I saw a cool board on Pinterest or I saw a cool architecture firm presented a project in a fun way. These are all things that just, you know, you're being flooded with this information constantly as a student, as a designer, and you want to try to emulate it. I know I'm not going to say copy it, but try to take different things that help, help you do a better job at presenting your work. So, um let me do a screen share put that in quick if you don't currently have a folder a pinterest board some place where you can just dump design inspiration um do that yesterday so let me okay so this is a project can everyone see that right this was a project that uh, we did, well, I did on fifth year in Christopher Harnish's studio, Malawi studio. And as you can see, there's a whole lot of empty space. And this is maybe a really kind of rookie or amateur kind of way to fill up a board, but just literally use, I, I was starting to use the sky as part as the main rendering, as that was like your main focal point. And that allowed me to kind of just kind of forget about that space. Now, granted, a lot of people will argue and saying like, no, that's still empty space, use it. I personally like it. I'm very minimalist at some sense. I think white space is okay. Um, but again, this is one of those things where I knew based on the architecture that I was trying to achieve throughout that semester, I knew one of the perspectives that was really going to capture my eye that I liked. And I wanted to achieve that in a charrette. Again, this was a shred. This was, I think, 10 days. And I let that image, the first, the first image over to the left, I let that dictate the rest of the board. I wanted to create that open sky. Um, yeah, and kind of minimize the information that wasn't so important. I mean, the text is important, but I try to keep that small uh, site plan. Diagrams forced to the bottom just to anchor it. And again, this was a format. I look at board layouts the same way as uh, somebody's laying out a resume. Uh, there's different there's different influences online, and this is a format that I saw where there was white space that created a solid border on the bottom to kind of anchor everything to the to the board. So I saw that and I was like, "Wow, I want to try it." So here it is. Um, and this actually turned out to be one of my most favorite boards, even though the information on it is really wonky. The design is, isn't good at all, but I still had fun doing it. For the most part. Um, don't look too closely at the plan because you can see a lot of stuff doesn't work. The axiom metric, typically you want to be showing different types of information. I'm just showing a picture with no information on it. So again, I was just trying to go for the like elegant wow factor rather than actually tell correct information. Should you do that? Probably not. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing that. Um, Drake, you had a really nice board too. So is there anything that you wanna, how do I stop sharing? Yeah, let me, uh, I can pull mine up. There you go. Um, so I'm, I'm always a big fan of like, I don't like blocky boards, <laughs> um, personally, I don't kind of like, you know, here's a, here's an object, it's kind of nicely cropped with the border, here's another one that's kind of nicely cropped. Um, I don't I almost take like a movie poster approach to my kind of competition boards, my project boards. Um, where I try and make every aspect try to um, very cohesive with one another, um, but also like fairly cinematic <laughs> in a way. Um, you know, so with this one, I knew I knew going into it, um, I wanted this kind of big money shot view where both of my renders kind of like 
bleed into each other. Um, and then from there, I kind of let the rest of the pieces kind of fall into place. Um, um, unlike Hutton, like he was saying, I don't really start with board layouts um, and work towards them. I kind of fall into my board layouts for the most part. Um, but I also think I, I tend to do these like crazier boards just because, um, especially when I was in school, like, you know, why not do it? You can always come back and do, you know, nice and orderly um, organized presentation boards. But, you know, you don't always get the chance to do some kind of crazy single movie poster um, board or some of my older boards um, from like past projects I've done. Like I had one that, that was- That Blade like, Runner board yeah, you had? Yeah, my Blade Runner board from D5, um, my Russian propaganda board from D4. Um, like, you know, like, they're crazy and they're obnoxious and Drake always had the fun <laughs> boards. Always. Everyone always looked forward to seeing it. <laughs> Not like, like whether the the design was good, bad, whatever, the board was always awesome. <laughs> and <laughs> like awesome. Lo looking at a lot of them objectively, they did not communicate my ideas the best. Um, I certainly sacrificed content for style. Um, but that was a decision I was fine with making. Right. Um, but because... again, that's kind of what separated your style from a lot of other students. And I'm not saying every student should be trying to you know, do their own thing, but mm. there's something special about that you quickly became known for having always a different aesthetic for each one of the boards. And if you had some type of you know, like little idea, you just ran with it. Full board. <laughs> so shameless plug as well um, on my website. I think I've managed to strike a balance between some of these. Um, so I have this kind of splash display page where it's a little vignette of all of the projects kind of as, as like one continuous line. Um, but then each project in itself is able to have its own style completely independent um, of that aesthetic. And here I've fallen into that very nice orderly um, style that I thought, you know, throughout school I'd never do. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm liking, I'm liking subtlety. I think it's a, I think it's a good, it's a good look. <laughs> Is this a new project? Uh, no, that was a D, that was my D8 cabin project, the last one there. Nice. Um, also with board layout, it's called maturity, nice. With board layout, uh, depending on the type of architecture, type of design you did or design, that could really inform how you're laying out your space. Uh, I know, what was it with Stewartson? We had a very, was it vertical? It was a vertical layout. So in Drake's case, it was, it was really nice. Um, cause obviously, cause it was a vertical stand. Uh, let me share, share my screen. This is stupid trying to jump back and forth. I had a very horizontal uh, project for Stewartson. Well, I think it just froze my computer. <laughs> okay, here we go. So I'm not sure if you guys could see that, but it was a very it was a very horizontal project. So that right off the bat, and once they told us, and um, all the projects they typically were horizontal boards all the years before for the stewards. And for this one, it was just like okay, for the first time we're going to be doing a vertical board. Um, the, you know, this wasn't going through my mind while I was designing something, but with a fire watchtower as your prompt it makes sense to do a vertical board because you think, okay, well, all the designs are going to be some type of vertical layout. So you kind of always have that, uh, the prompt that's kind of, um, I don't want to say telling you how you're going to design or how they have an idea of how the projects are going to work, right? If that makes sense. Uh, this was kind of difficult in a sense where 
there's a lot of things that would have worked very nicely if the boards were horizontally formatted. But in the case, you know, it wasn't. So I had to work with what we had. So in that case, it was a, a matter of scaling uh, the section in the lower left-hand corner. I wanted that to be really big. That had to be, that had to grow or shrink to only a single size of the board. These uh, renderings on the right-hand side, lower right-hand side, I wanted those to be bigger. But the way things started working out, I had to drop them to the right bottom right-hand corner. Um, even with the top perspective, where you see horizontal uh, the mountains and the piece of architecture, the pizza slice, if you will, if you want to call it that, like you don't even get a full sense of it. It's more, it's just a little sliver. Because, I mean, granted, if I turned it, you probably could get a full, full like horizontal image. But uh, these are some of the things that, as I'm laying this out, again, I'm coming from the the notion that you lay things out ahead of time. That way it kind of helps you inform what type of images could go where, how big those images should be. Um, this all little things like this were going through the back of my mind. When you're designing something, they, tech, they shouldn't be going through your mind. This is all things that as you continue to do it, as you, you know, uh, do it multiple times, it becomes easier to do it. Um, Let's see, I'm just thinking if there's anything else that's worth talking about on here. Does anyone have any other questions while I have this board so I don't? Okay, no, all right. <laughs> Back again. Um, I think something else to ask you guys that might be helpful. Um, what do you sort of do when you kind of just don't have an idea, like when you start a project, but you are basically uncertain about how to progress with it. You know, like that one moment you're like, all right, what do I do? Um, I'm still asking that question. <laughs> um, um, yeah, well, I mean. So I, I know for me personally, I, I really just love kind of soaking up knowledge about pretty much anything I can. Um, so I find if there's some aspect of a project I'm stuck on or like I can't begin, I'll, I'll just read, I'll just research, I'll just, you know, poke around and look for anything. Even things that are so far tangentially related. Um, I find it just kind of adds to the pool of like potential things I can, you know, kind of take away and put into the project. Is there, um, as Andrew's adding, um, who do you go to when you get stuck? Anyone but myself. <laughs> Friends. They're the best. They're your friends for your reason, for a reason. Um, I could always rely on Kyle, for instance, just to give it to me straight, or Derek Sabinga to yeah. completely kill any idea or dreams that I had. Uh, <laughs> and you'll find, you'll quickly figure out who it's good to go to if you want to get some uplifting truth or some realistic. Uh, I don't know, just stuff to make you upset or stuff to make you happy. Do you have a friend for that? But it's really important to kind of gauge um, gauge the information that you're after. Because sometimes I want to look for a more creative, um, creative uh, critique on a project. I'll go to Kyle. If I want to get a more technical critique, I'm going to go to Derek. It's kind of fun. You uh, start to understand everyone's skill set, and uh, being able to go to those people, whoever it may be, or whatever they may know, do, or be good at, or even be bad at, uh, it's always good to get that input. I would also add in situations where maybe you can't or don't want to go to someone um, for some help. Um, I found a couple like cheats or kind of tricks that work for me um 
So one, there's this uh, tactic, phenomenon, whatever you want to call it, um, that programmers use called rubber duck coding. Um, or what they'll do is they'll sit a rubber duck on their computer and they'll explain their code to this rubber duck um, in, in a process for them to actually like verbally work through what they're doing to find out the problems themselves. Um, so sometimes I'll just sit back and, you know, I'll, I'll talk to five-year-old Drake and try and explain what I'm doing to him. Um, and usually in that process, I might be able to come to some realizations. Um, if I find myself getting stuck on if there's something I should or shouldn't be working on, I, I try and contextualize it towards someone else. Um, you know, like if I were to, you know, if I'm stuck on something really mundane and I think to myself, what if Christine came over to me right now and said, I've spent two hours trying to texture this kitchen counter and it's not working. What would I say to her response? Um, and then I'll just take that information, <laughs> use it for myself, essentially. That's an interesting way to look at, like coming at it from a different perspective, mm -hmm. looking at it as if somebody else is looking at. Yeah, work. like it's like it's not your problem you're solving; it's yeah. someone else's. How would you look yeah. at it? It's funny because it always seems like you're able to kind of figure out someone else's problem because you're looking at it with a new, fresh, like set of eyes. The amount of times where I ran into something where it's just like, you know, whether I just kind of gave a little bit of uh you know some type of input and like, oh yeah cool or the amount of times like more so than not but that, that somebody came over and said like why don't you just like you know turn it upside down blah 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 that but that <laughs> it, it actually turned out to be like awesome and it's like that that like phenomenon that's amazing that's pretty awesome when that happens um and i think that's sometimes taken for granted and a lot of people don't realize the power of having people look at your work or being able to suck up your pride and ask for help, do it, just do it. And I know I never wanted to until I realized that was biting me in, in the butt that I wasn't asking for help. And so many people were like, just ask for help, just ask for help, ask questions. Uh, so, and now I catch myself asking too many questions. Okay. Now people are getting sick of me because I'm always asking them questions. <laughs> But it's okay to ask questions. All right. Um, we have another question from the chat. Um, are you guys ever just constantly thinking about the program as you design? Or um, does the old rule of cool come into play and, you know, the, oh, this would really look cool idea kind of start to influence any of your work? Or do you find that there's like a bit of a balance? Definitely learn that balance. Hmm. Uh, when I first came into school, it was always the, what will make it look cool, you know, because uh, I've always wanted to do the cool renderings. And I'm quickly realizing that uh, you definitely need to have that balance uh, to inspire and kind of drive your projects. And again, you learn, you learn how to create that balance or achieve that balance fairly quickly. Um, the more you, the more you design, the more you present. And the more you take inspiration from your classmates and see other people presenting. I've, I've found that the more I've learned about architecture, um, the less interested in, the less interested I am in like these crazy complex geometric forms that um, you always have this idea that you should design or like that's like the pinnacle of some sort. Um, like nowadays, I feel like I'm much more interested in seeing, you know, a, a simple box that's a house, but like all of the details are just done like in a way that looks effortlessly. Oh boy. Um, I never I think, think that. <laughs> I, yeah, I think when things look effortless, that is like some of the highest quality design that there is. You guys have to realize the king of like <laughs> glass hopper design just said that. <laughs> um, I'm going to share something because Andrew said I should share it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I answered in the chat here um, to answer Zach's question. I'll just read it out. For me, beauty in architecture is functionality. If it's visually cool, but hurts how the design functions for the user or buildings for performance, then is it worth it? Think about how your architecture is answering a problem. Um, 
Yeah, I think definitely like first year, second year, even now I'm still like really struggling with it. It's kind of like, oh, is this gonna look cool? Like I wanted to like, you know, be visually eye pleasing, but I think there's something uh, really nice about simplicity um, and it's extremely hard to um, achieve. And, you know, it's coming, it's something I'm struggling with right now in my own uh, design studio. We're actually doing a charrette and we had this very complicated uh, inflatable facade that we just heard is gonna uh, be too expensive, but maybe not. We'll see if we can get a sponsor, but um, yeah, so we're doing a charrette now and even just being able to take a step back and redesign it and make it come up with the most cost-effective, um, constructability effective uh, solution has, has, I think you've already started to help uh, the project. I think what's also, oh, sorry, Andre. I, I was gonna say, I, um, I, I don't think that like the aesthetics of a project are necessarily where um, is like the end all be all. Um, I think there's so many other things you can delve into um, concerning architecture that are uh, in a lot of ways more fruitful, I would say. Um, like, what about the constructability of this project? What if, you know, your project is constructed in some beautiful manner? Um, or what if there's just some, for lack of a better term, gimmick um, that you can implement <laughs> into your project? Um, like I'm thinking to a project that I did in like D3. Um, it was a CLT row home, um, but I I had laid out where all of the pieces come from out of like standard CLT sheets, and every offcut became a piece that was added to the rain screen, um, and it looked bad. Like objectively, there was no rhyme or reason to this rain screen, but it was worth it just to be able to say. You know, I've 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 ran the numbers. I've done. I put in the work. You know, there is no scrap in this project, um, and I think that that feat alone is kind of it outweighs any of the aesthetic principles, uh, at least for me in my mind. Right. Yeah. There's different different. I guess I don't want to say categories, but different things that you people will try to achieve or. Um, going back to like the idea of what's, I guess the balance between like functionality and uh, aesthetics. I mean, like some of the most functional architecture is like an Amazon warehouse. Is that pretty? No, I mean, but it's functional. Um, I feel like any architecture is gonna have to be functional in some way, shape or form. So the idea of this functionality, like even a talking point in architecture. I just like, I feel like art is water is wet. You know, it's kind of like one of those things. It's like, yes, it has to be functional. If it's not functional, well then you're just playing in dirt or like you're just playing with popsicle sticks, not to sound rude, but that's kind of how it is. And that's the whole point of going through these processes and going through school is understanding that functionality is one of those kind of like the key staples to creating architecture or creating design or a lot of things. Um, so yeah, it, that's, it's becomes really interesting in your projects when you take an approach such as Drake did, where it's not about focusing on the function or the aesthetic, but more so the assembly. And that will sometimes, many times help push your project further and kind of realize a project as, um, good architecture. I mean, there's countless, <laughs> countless amount of firms projects that say like yeah we did this differently because we did this um i, I you know i'm not going to try to name things off just because i mean they have a brain fart right now but it's just like it's that's what makes good architecture sometimes the assembly is that's that's what's it and whether it's beautiful whether it's ugly it's still um i don't want to say it's subjective but i mean it can be it very well can be Function program is restrictive. The restriction offers opportunity. Correct, yeah. There's a solution in every problem. That's also very important. I, 
I mean, yeah. Restrictions and limitations are the, uh, the foundation of creativity. I'm not sure if I said this yet, but you can make anything look good. <laughs> I mean, whether, whether we're actually in the actual industry, but I'm saying like uh, in terms of design and in studio, you can make any project. You can polish, polish anything <laughs> as we say. <laughs> so don't, I know I get caught up in that. I'm like, oh, I want to make it look cool, but don't worry about that. Just worry about creating a good project that you enjoy and making it look cool can come later. They have so many good programs out there right now. Why is the light not on my face? And um, to add what Han, to what Han's saying, you know, if you enjoy the project, you'll find it cool no matter what. Um, the coolness of your project is really only should really only be the aspect that keeps you invested in it to really continue working on it. Because if you're not interested in the project you're working on, you should probably just find a new project to work on. Right, right, right. And some of the programs, like if you're getting really good at some of the programs, it makes it fun to work with. Like Enscape, Lumion, mm -hmm. um, Twin Motion, all these rendering softwares, like those are practically video games. Revit, uh, that's allowing you to do um, the drawing set. <laughs> level it's like, killing like seven birds with one stone with these new programs and it's just absolutely amazing pencils nails and sawdust <laughs> i think those are ivano's constraints right now judging from <laughs> hey, i have a question for you guys how did how did you transition or or, or make the move from the traditional drawing methods of understanding plan, section, elevation, representing those correctly to the rendering software and aspects, keeping that richness or understanding from the conventional methods into your digital realm. How, how did you guys manage that? And maybe even where were you with your conventional method skills and drawings moving into the rendering skills and drawings that you have? Oh, um, I, I think once I learned to start thinking of like orthographic drawings, more, more like an interior designer rather than an architect. Um, I think that was a big step for me. Um, cause I think, I think going in into like, you know, first and second year, I had this thought of like, this is a plan. It is a white background. It is black line work. You are pushing where you cut and everything like, everything was kind of fit within this box of like, this is a plan, this is how it has to look. This is a section, this is how it has to look. The only difference between my plan and your plan is what we're cutting through. Um, and then I think as I began to move into, you know, doing them digitally, um, you know, not, not digitally in terms of like drawing them in CAD, but um, post-processing them through Photoshop through Illustrator or even rendering like actual like plans or sections. Um, I, I realize they don't just have to be lines on a paper. They can, they can tell a story. They can show aspects of a project that you couldn't otherwise do um, with just line work. Um, like I like to show light pouring through um, in like my plans and sections that I draw nowadays. Um, you know, I'll take the time to render those in because I think it it tells a much better story of like actually experiencing the project than I think some 2D lines can do. Yeah, um, so when I came into school, I came in with the notion that I was going to be able to create some of the coolest renderings. <laughs> And that's what I cared about. Everything else suffered because of that. Uh, my line work skills, I had the first year, like you focus on actually drafting with a pencil eraser in the drafting board. Um, they weren't great. Like my drawings weren't great by any means, uh, but you quickly realize that you're converting over to a digital format. It's uh, an era of electronics. 
right? So I'm, I'm dealing with this now. Some of the most simple programs like AutoCAD, I didn't really, really focus on how to use 2D line work, things like that. I focused on understanding architecture in three-dimensional space, such as Rhino. And I think that's mainly because that's one of the programs that we're, uh, we were taught, right? Um, and because of that, we were starting to pull, or even with like Revit, you build it out first in three dimensions, and then it's almost like you're backtracking. That's when you take your um, sections, maybe your plans. And currently at work, it's, you know, what, where I'm working now, it's the opposite. It's the original way. You know, you start with a plan, you start with a section, you start with an elevation. And then if you have the ability and time, like you create a three-dimensional model with it. It's just, it's funny because for me, I felt like I learned backwards or I excelled um, the wrong way, right? It's like, I, I didn't really understand the fundamentals of designing architecture drafting. Um, it's like, I got a sense of how to run and I just started trying to run rather than learning actually how to walk um, because I was working in three dimensions with Rhino and Revit. So there's definitely evidence where some things are more powerful than others, such as like plan, plan work compared to say your digital renderings or exploded axometrics. Uh, it's, it's an interesting conversation because it's different for everyone. Uh, some people really enjoy working in plans. Some people really enjoy working in section as sections like one of the most important drawings to help you understand architecture. Uh, I continue to hear that today. Uh, so like, yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> uh, it's a very exciting time though, because um, we're certainly in an era where we're no longer just constrained to kind of plan section and elevation um, because of, you know, a lot of the power that we can bring from like, um, you know, digital software. Um, we're seeing new developing, like new drawing methods developed um, all the time. Um, like we're seeing some of the most uh, bizarre ways of kind of cutting or unfolding or displaying space that, um, you know, really couldn't have been done before. Um, but yeah, um, looking back through the chat, though, I think Olivia makes a really powerful point. Um, sometimes the best rolling you need is just, you know, a couple strokes of pen on paper. Um, it's, it's very easy. Uh, to get sucked into the digital rabbit hole. Um, I say that as someone who is so far deep, <laughs> there's really no escape for me at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, it's all about conveying ideas. Right. And that kind of leads to uh, the other question. When developing a new idea, what would you say is the most critical part to focus on first so that it may come to fruition? the concept <laughs> i mean that's i personally feel that um spiritually because if you could get a good concept and run with it it's it's a good project i mean grant is like now um in the actual practice Ivano, maybe you could talk more on that <laughs> how what <laughs> how strong a concept is in architectural practice overrated <laughs> okay here we go <laughs> so that's the idea if in school concept is extremely important in practice maybe not you can't so have a concept if you don't know how to spell letters and words and draw right and stuff like that how are you, how are you going to construct a concept if um <laughs> if you don't even know the language yet we're too preoccupied with that. I'm sorry. I know it's a it's a key factor, but if you can't draw like you guys are all saying, if you can't sketch a thing or stuff of that nature, you know that's why we compensate by doing the eye candy stuff. 
it mm-hmm. looks good. Wow, it looks good. I'm excited. Yeah, okay, whatever. Can't make a building work. You talked about, you guys know it already. The functionality is just as important as uh, the beauty of it. And both are just as important, but you got to make it work. And I'm pretty sure that's something you roasted me on a few times <laughs> in studio. Where it's just like, I'm enough with the eye candy. <laughs> Don't, don't think we haven't, I'm sure Mike and I, probably the oldest guys here, sorry, Mike. Um, <laughs> we did the same thing. I loved making renderings. I, I was allured, I was sucked into it. You know, I, I wanted to be Frank Lloyd Wright. I wanted to draw like his beautiful images, you know, and stuff like that. And um, first I, had a, I got my ass whooped by my bosses saying, you know, you can't even figure out a bathroom, you wanna do that. <laughs> you know, so. It, it works both ways. You know, you look at little kids and they uh, start to learn how to walk and they start running and then they fall. And you, you know, you do, you keep doing it. You just persist. Mm-hmm. And yes, I'm living in sawdust at the moment. You're correct, Hunter. Hunter. Hunter, <laughs> Hunting, sorry. I like Hunter better. It's still <laughs> wrong. <laughs> My name's right there. I see it. I'm a greaseball. What do you want? I can't. I, I can't read. Up those I can't read that word on aren't Italian. They're not. It's not phonetic. No, it is phonetic, isn't it? Hunt, hunt, whatever. <laughs> I'm, like off. I'm going back to my. <laughs> Remember, kids, you have to learn how to read first, too. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Got to learn how to write. So I'm screwed either way. If I talk or write, I'm still screwed. It's all right. At least we get a laugh out of it. That's what it's all about. What's this meeting all about? I don't know what, what I like. I didn't even want to sign in and I signed in on a Friday night. I should be drinking <laughs> bourbon. What's this about? What are we talking about, Andrew? You're be here, Ivano. You just showed up. I know. Well, I got a text. I saw a text. I know. I appreciate well, it. What are you laughing about, Elizabeth? <laughs> Mike, help me, Mike. How are we doing? Uh, good. So, so I, I came in because I thought it would be helpful for our second year students to hear from these guys um, how they, and this is the term I use all the time, how do you tell your story? Because what we should be looking at and critiquing is your intent and the process that you use to get there. And as Ivano always says, and I'm more conscious of it more and more that it works um, and try not to get to the I like, although I mentioned that too, because I like what I like, but um, I was hoping that the students would get some insight as to how best to do that um, graphically and uh, quickly and clearly meaning the story part and just to hear from these guys how they went about doing that. I, I have two of my students here. I'm wondering if they would speak up. Wyatt, Seema. Yeah, uh, kudos to the students that showed up too. I know sometimes time, pre- pre- particularly on a Friday, is you know maybe not the best time, but kudos to you guys who showed up. What do you think? First of all, our time is more important than their time, so they should be <laughs> time. Okay? <laughs> Wyatt, Seema. First of all, I'd like to see your faces. I hate not seeing faces. They, they may not be at their station right now. No, oh, so it's all bullshit. They're just making believe. Danny, Danny's here, maybe. Uh, I'm here. Is Wyatt. Wyatt came running in from the other room. He heard his name. We'll, have to, they, well, we're going to post this later. So if they don't want to show their faces, they don't yeah. have to be on video to show their faces. But they can text in and they can, uh, they can share on that. the, because uh, we're reading out the questions in the, in the chat. Hi, Seema. Questions. Wyatt, come on. I want to hear something from you. Um, uh, I don't know. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> I think you had a good uh, point about um, drawing and the importance of uh, hand drawing over the, like, the fixation that we have on... Uh, on a concept and I think that we get really bogged down about the concept and we um it's like we don't 
we don't even care if the graphics are good if the concept is bad. Um, like even if the graphics are good uh, and your project isn't the greatest, it can still be a success in that way. So I think there's a, there's a lot of things to focus on other than just, um, you know, your, your main idea uh, in your project. Um, and, um, there's an old Eastern saying that how do you begin movement when you work with a thing like a noun? How does, how does a noun create a verb? The reality is that, you know, if the idea that you have a concept is kind of an idea and therefore a noun, and then it's static, and then you need a verb. So I think it's going back to just drawing and drawing and making things that fundamentally, subconsciously, the stuff will come out that either you get the idea from it, or someone walks by and says, oh my God, turns the model upside down, like Hunton, whatever that damn name is said, you know, and flips the model and says, oh, Jesus, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's all about this. And, and there's the aha moment. I don't think we trust ourselves enough where we have too much fear, like I said earlier, or, or maybe too much ego sometimes, which is probably the same thing as I clean my computer. Um, you know, we're preoccupied with exposing ourselves or not exposing ourselves. I think it's all philosophical in, in my opinion. Too much bullshit, Ivana. Hunter, Hunter, Mr. Moyer. This dude's wearing a mask behind him. Look at the guy with the uh, Jeff cap. Is it Jeff cap, or is that his hair? For some reason, a bunch of idiots always gravitate towards me, <laughs> including professors that are idiots. Um, to continue off of what Spain was um, talking about before in regards to the story of the project, um, I think it would be good to kind of ask. Uh, you guys sort of how you go about deciding on how to tell that story you know how do you decide on what are the important images or kind of the images that should just always be there because um, I think one thing that lower level students always struggle with is the idea that they have to have every single thing that's on the brief um, so they don't ever really end up exploring like what other drawings would be useful um, and, and if you want you know you can take advantage of those idiots behind you and have uh, them join the conversation too. They just walked out, thankfully. So. Hey, hey, Sal, um, just think of the word brief, right? It's just a brief. It's just a beginning. It's not, it's not a, you know, an absolute. We, you know, we're making believe. Mike and Andrew, maybe they don't believe this, but I'm making believe I know something and it's not true. I, know, <laughs> don't, I don't know shit. <laughs> is that hallelujah or what is that, Mike? <laughs> Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I keep saying that we're, I, I'd like to believe that we continue to be students as educators, you know, educators. Um, and I keep telling you guys, and, you know, you might remember when I've had both of you two, um, or a couple of you, three of you, four of you, whatever, um, I'm learning constantly more than you guys will ever, ever catch up. I mean, it, we're lear I'm learning a lot. You know, I, I can't pronounce names. But architecturally, um, it's all inside me, constipating me up and everything. And, uh, you know, it comes out sooner or later. So is that what you needed to hear or something, Sal? What did you, you wanted to hear from us, right? Yeah, uh, you, Spain, Hutton, Drake, really just anyone. Okay. I, can I tell you that I really like your headphones? They're like pretty cool. Thanks. I got them uh, around Christmas, so. Probably your girlfriend. Very nice. For you. Nope. No. <laughs> Um, I, I, I agree with you, Ivano. I do think, though, sometimes uh, I wonder if the, the tenor of my conversation about what is, quote unquote, do or what you should have gives students the impression that if they don't do that or do a certain thing or whatever, it's going to affect their grade or they're not going to have a good review. And I, and I try to check that as much as I can. Um, and come back to all I want is that you're able to convey your intent and you show the process because this is the learning part. You show the process of how you've gotten there to convince the reader that what you've come up with is based in something rational and it works. As long as you do that, 
you're fine. Even with all the check the boxes things, I've seen some um, presentations where plan section elevation, what have you, are you know on the side and then you know maybe four by four uh, images, and you have one awesome freaking perspective. The entire critique will be based on comments and observations of that perspective. The plans and all that shall just show as informational pieces as to where you are or how high it is, but you are talking about that thing that speaks to all of your ideas. If you go in with that mindset, I think you'll loosen yourself up and, and maybe not be so anxious about what you have to have as opposed to what you should show and tell. Just, just to clarify two things, if you don't mind, Mike, the, when you say intent, it's very possible that um, younger architects would interpret that as concept. And that's not necessarily what you mean, right? Right, exactly. Uh, it, it's, so there's the concept and then there, the intent is what are you bringing this to? What is the final, uh, in your mind, solution or how you solve the problem? What am I reading in that as your intentions of your concept? Um, like when you date someone, that's your concept, right? But what are your, what's your intent? What's going to happen, you know, a year or two from now? <laughs> are we going to get married or, or what? So it's really, the intent is really from that concept, the process to what you see as the final solution. Let us know what that intention is. That's why I dated my wife for 19 years. See, you were you were conceptually all over the place. I was working. I was working. <laughs> and also, uh, a clarity again in reference to saying the perspective, you don't necessarily mean the eye candy perspective again. No, uh, the informational image that speaks to your idea. Um, and, and I've seen some that have been done in pastel or you know, just black and white line drawings, whatever. It just puts me there and everything that you talked about and felt and wanted to kind of display and speak about your intent is there in that drawing and you get it. And I really get excited when I see stuff like that. You can't stop talking about it um, when you see those types of things. Seema has her hand up. Yeah, I was going to mention something that uh, I used to hear a lot last year from the upper years is that um, we can take advantage of making mistakes. So keeping that in mind um, and a bunch of what uh, Hunt said earlier, like touching on like being able to take the critique from others instead of just saying, OK, yeah, and like moving on. I think it's super important to keep that in mind with like we're learning as we go along and it shouldn't always be perfect, especially now, like really take advantage of the fact that we can make these mistakes. And like with every crit that we have, um, the comments that we get, the crit that we get should be applied to each project and like um, looking at like future references as well. So I just wanted to note that. We have to lose uh, this idea of perfection. We really have to lose it because, you know, I'm standing in a space right now that if I turn around, there's a billion mistakes, you know? And that, you know, 30, what are you laughing about, Andrew? That was me laughing. Oh, it came out of his mouth visually. Um, it, it, it's, you know, this is one, this is the 45th house I've designed or something. I don't know. It, it's just hopefully it gets better and better. You know what I mean? So the perfection thing, you got to let it go. You got to let it go. I mean, I think that you guys get that. I was a dumbass in school, you know, I, I didn't know much. The nuns beat the shit out of me and um, I got really good at, not being bright and being okay with it or something. And just, you know, I just, persistence is what's key. You know, that race is won by persistence. It's not won by that perfect intellect. Yeah, I think, I think there exists this perception that like the difference between a master and an amateur is how many mistakes they make. And that's just not true. Um, a master, they know where the mistakes are and they know, they play into it. They know how to make it work. 
Yeah, but Drake, they also they learn from that mistake. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that's that's the that's the part. Yeah. They not only do they learn from it, but they know how to they know how to make make their mistakes good. <laughs> I mean, sense. listen, uh, we as jurors, when we get to see these things, um, you know, we're quicker to recognize the failings and the opportunities, and and that's why that perfect rendering. Um, isn't really the, I mean, they're, they're provocative. You can't deny it. And it's, it's our, you know, our contemporary times that we live in. But, um, you know, the other information has to be there or it's just not, it's not working. Yeah, you can't only eat ice cream. <laughs> and don't say that to my wife. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth, you're, you're quiet. It's not like you. <laughs> I've been typing in the chat a little bit, but I think I've been absorbing a lot more um, from listening to Drake and Hutton. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, I think um, I've talked about with you and with Andrew about um, what second year is going through right now with everything. And I think that um, a lot of the questions that were asked and the answers were spot on to what I would have answered. So I think that this was a really constructive and really helpful conversation. And I really hope that when we get the YouTube link, it can go out and that more kids will actually watch this and listen to it to really, because I think it's almost, it's, I'm glad there's people here, but it's almost upsetting that there's not more of them here because a lot of them were struggling with these 10 day charrettes, so. What do you think about that, Andrew? Um, Boss? I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think um, you, don't, you don't learn by not stretching and you don't get better by staying away from things that are hard. You have to lean into it. If it's hard, you got to keep practicing at it so it gets better. If it's easy and you keep doing it because it's easy, then you're not learning anything. So, um, I mean, we had a lot of points about like learning from mistakes, making mistakes, not being afraid of making mistakes, um, adding to your language, drawing enough so that you have stuff, you have context to work with, drawing the context so you have stuff to work with, um, getting over this feeling that, uh, you're just going to sit and think really hard and come up with the answer and it's going to be the right answer, which is just like a brutal way of holding yourself to a standard. I think that these 10 day projects are a challenge. I think they make it so that you have to decide and move forward and you have to be, even if you're not okay with it. And I think that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest challenge that I've seen for this current second year group. But I think it's also something that we all struggle with, right? Like if we could just think harder, if we could just have one more day. I mean, every single presentation I've ever made, if I could just have one more day, it would have been better. But also I would have never finished it. So uh, the stuff that I did is good because it's done, not because it has mistakes in it. So, I mean, it's the same thing. I was laughing because my house has mistakes all over the place. I mean, I would do this room entirely different. And I realized the better design, the moment I put the last piece of trim and painted it. I, I literally painted the last piece of trim and I was like, you idiot, you should have done this. But it was more important to, I, I also was so afraid of making a mistake. I lived in a construction site for two years. I actually like the fact that it's done way more than it being constantly under construction too. But I love construction. It's just that you gotta find the balance. And balance is not something that you find and then it's at rest. I think that's the other thing. Like, it's not about being at rest. It's about constantly remaining in balance. That's, that's, a, that's a verb. It's not a noun, mm -hmm. to your point. So, what, yeah, it's, uh, it's supposed to be. What, uh, I have to go. Bye, Hunter. Thanks for coming. Wait, Thanks Hunter, for coming I, wanna on. I wanna ask you a question. <laughs> Sorry, you got a minute? Yeah, let's go. Of course you do. Slow down, relax which is exactly what I want to talk about. Time management. How do you guys in upper years, have, how have you been handling time management or not? And um, because I think that's part of it. If we're talking two week charrettes, 
you either need to understand your time management or you're just going to just spin your wheels or so. Anybody, anyone, Hunt, before you leave? Um, okay, so I know how long it takes me to do something because I've done it multiple times and everyone will learn that about themselves. If it takes someone a longer time to model, well then you should start on that sooner rather than later. If it takes you a long, long to kind of create the final imagery or the final board, make sure you allocate time for that. And don't think, oh, this time around, I'm gonna figure it out. You know, it's the same thing. It's like, if you think it's gonna take 30 minutes, it's gonna take three hours. All right, that's, people say that for a reason because it's entirely true. As I was saying, like, don't think that you're gonna be better at it next time around. Best case scenario, yeah, you're gonna be great at it and you nailed it the second time around. But don't think that way. Always allocate enough time for yourself to get these things done. Or, um, or with that being said, how do you allot that time? It really comes from understanding how long it takes you to do each task. And once you get a better idea, that's when you could start paving out, laying out a schedule, going back to Drake's schedule that he that he did, where you know you have day one, day two, day three, and it allows you to map these things out to try to get a better idea. That's what I was doing for uh, the Stewartson, where the first three days, uh, it was just me just trying to get in the right mental headspace. And then finally reading the prompt, doing a quick con uh, concept, which also I wanted to you know, end by saying, like, um, don't overthink it. Don't second guess yourself. I mean, you could second guess yourself for maybe a few minutes, but don't waste time. Don't second guess yourself. Don't overthink it, just do it. Um, and that's, that allows you to take the time to do each task individually. Another thing is that I always get caught up in is when I'm doing one task, my brain starts to go like, oh, shoot, I still have to do this. And then I like all that mental energy is starting to be dispersed everywhere else on all the other things that you have to do rather than focusing on the task at hand. I heard just, I literally heard this from like, uh, I think like a TikTok yesterday. It was just like, if you constantly stress about doing something mentally, or what is it like? If you think about doing it and you stress it, that means you put yourself through that um, situation twice. So it's like that. I, it sounds so stupid and cliche, but it's just like that actually resonated with me because I was just like, I overthink things, I overstress on things, making sure that they want to be good, correct. Don't. Don't, and it's so much easier to say it than to actually do it, but just, just focus on what has to get done. Do it. You know, it's like the Nike, just do it. Ain't nothing to it, but to do it. And like, there's so many things that you could say just to try to help you get through it. But I mean, that's, that's what it takes. My favorite also is, um, I think this was like a military, but like embrace the suck. Like if you find yourself having a tough time on something, just embrace the suck and do it. You know, I mean, that, that sounds terrible to say, like, while you're talking about this is your education, your schooling, but people could say that for everything, you know, doing yard work, you know, doing the dishes, just do it. And the more you get that mentality of just doing something and not overthinking things, don't be a talker, be a doer. You know, the more you're able to do that, the more you're able to actually achieve these quick charrettes and whether they suck at first, so be it. All right. You're going to do more. You're going to do a lot more. And then that's when you get better at them. The thing I so would add that little sorry. Um, time management rant escapade. I got to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. See you guys. See you. The only thing I would add to that, guys, is, um, you know, is knowing the right tool based on, you know, the time, can, the, the tool you choose to express. Maybe model making is not the right choice at that time. As, you know, he said, you know, get the model done there. If you have to sketch the whole project because time constraints are what they are, then you sketch it. I think it also um, comes down to also thinking about the type of drawings you're using as which also influences how you tell your story. Because if you're short on time, it might be most efficient to, you know, use say something like an axon to function as multiple drawings in one. Um, just as a time saver. And you can also build that into your storyline as well for the entire project. I, uh, I'm going to use Seema because she's left, but I, I'll gladly tell her, you know, she texted me this, you know, today and said, um, 
So let me get this clear. Um, you just want sketches. <laughs> and all I want is they're making models and they're sketching. And they, they had a hard time believing that it would be OK. I want the sketches in a certain fashion, but uh, it, it's OK. I'd rather see ideas manifest, um, come to life, rather than um, you know a pretty picture or checking the boxes of, I did this, I did that, I did that. It's an exercise that we have to practice because the real world does not allow you ever enough time. That's why as professors, if you wanna call us that, um, we always wanna go back to school because we never have enough time to really explore and enjoy the process that uh, is critical. Can I go drink my bourbon now? Andrew, boss. I'm gonna go have my pizza now because it's uh, yeah. yeah it's a good time to leave off too. Early. We started digital demos early, and more people showed up, and more people put it out on uh, various uh, places, and uh, now we can go have drinks and pizza. Is Sal yeah. running this thing, or what is that? Sal's the yep. yeah. Sal's the guy in charge. It's his. It's his thing. Dude, you got a shake. Yeah. So if you ever want to have any more, you know. Talks of wisdom, Ivano. Just let me know. I'll sum it up. Shave that, beard, shave that beard. <laughs> Never. I know you no, love I it. Don't. <laughs> wow, that was a hard no. All right. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, what other kind of uh, demo stuff do we have coming up, uh, Sal? What do you um, as of right now, it's going to be mostly um, more video tutorials on YouTube, just small little digital demo nuggets of information. Um, one thing I am thinking of planning is a possible Rhino workshop as a sort of open forum for anyone just struggling with Rhino in their projects. Um, as I know, it is a program that tends to be easy to use once you've mastered it, but when you're using it for the first time, it's just very, very like abrasive as a program um, for people who are unfamiliar. Any uh, any tutoring tutorials coming out, Olivia, anytime? Sorry. <laughs> I mean, we could. <laughs> okay. I, people just need to ask you, right? Email and all that kind of stuff too, right? Yeah, of course. Um, and, uh, and Sal, Instagram, our YouTube, best place to find us? Yep. Um, as I thank everyone for coming tonight and sharing their wisdom. Um, yes, you guys can follow us on Instagram at digital underscore demos, as well as our YouTube channel link, um, which will get out to everyone who's watched this video as well and anyone who requests it. Hey, thank you to everybody. Alumni, students, faculty, adjuncts, staff, uh, for being a part of this. And, uh, and if there was somebody who couldn't be here that you think would benefit from it, share the link with them because it'll be up later. And is the link on your, in the Instagram bio? Uh, yeah, we'll have a link to the uh, digital demos playlist in the Instagram bio. Okay. Yeah. There you go. All right. cool. yeah, thank you guys for coming tonight. That's the end of our demo. Bye everybody. Thank have you. a good weekend. Bye, thank